please welcome uh, Ava Montgomery. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, morning, or evening, whichever the case may be for you. Welcome to my presentation. Trigger warning, do new sensitivities mask a real social distance? when it comes to insensitivities of making and consuming media. My name is Ava Montgomery. I am the founder and principal consultant for Conscious Media Consulting. And so thank you to the coordinators of Artistic Climates for organizing another fantastic and enlightening event. And I'm delighted to be back for a second time. Have you seen the movie Songbird? Many people decry the fictional account of a raging pandemic set in 2024 as inappropriate and insensitive during a current real global pandemic with an astounding death toll. People have called the film's producer, Michael Bay, tone deaf and out of touch and exploiting the situation by making the movie. Is the movie Songbird art imitating life? Or is it just inducing fear in society and profiting from fear mongering? Are people being overly sensitive or and or selectively sensitive? Consider that many media outlets repeatedly air videos of black people taking their last breaths as they lie dying from police brutality. Do horrific replays educate society about the global pandemic of racism? Or are media outlets airing them to profit from people dying due to the ratings that showing them bring? Do those outlets have intentions to desensitize society to an astounding death toll of people belonging to a certain race or ethnicity? I'm currently in Croatia. I saw that Songbird was playing at a local event center that, and that socially distant precautions would be taken. I asked my neighbors if they would like to go see the movie as it would be in English, but with Croatian subtitles. They declined and were adamant that they did not want to see the movie because they felt it was just a ploy to stoke fear and make money, which I didn't disagree with. But it got me thinking about all the other media that gets released without consideration of people's feelings and sensitivity and how some people are okay with that. As it turned out, I was one of two people in the theater, which I think is the best way to see a movie. I debated in my mind if it was a slippery slope to get public approval before stories can get told whether unrestricted freedom of expression is a benefit for all, all of the time, or just for some people and when people are okay with it. Those are questions that I bring to you for your consideration among others that I'll have. And hopefully you have some that you will pose for our collective consideration and reflection as well. Let's take a look at the official trailer for the movie available on YouTube I think this trailer gives a good representation of the entire movie. Okay, so something to think about. What are your thoughts about the movie and the premise? Is it scary? Is it too close to the truth, too close to home? Are there a conspiracy? Is there a conspiracy going on? So the trailer has gotten over 1.9 million views on YouTube. I took a look at some of the comments to see what people thought about the premise. I've got a few that I'll share that gives a snapshot of some of the sentiments. But keep in mind, there are over 22,000 comments. So this really is just a snapshot. And notice the themes and which ones really resonate with people as indicated by the number of likes and comments that it received. No wonder they said this movie isn't doing well. It's because we are the movie. Is that someone being humorous or really worried? Does anybody remember Corona just being a drink, a little humor? And then I doubt Bob Marley would approve of this song being used for the movie. So worried about what other artists think about it. 
this movie is really in poor taste. Seriously, Hollywood, you're trying to make money off this so we get back to fear-mongering for profit? This is called psychological predictive programming. Is there a conspiracy involved? There's shows of apathy. The movie exists. One person, oh, scary. Another person might say, this is conditioning to us to get us to think a certain way. And a third person might say that it's a scare tactic. A 108 people agreed with that sentiment or liked it anyway. So are there suspicious, suspicious intentions with the movie? This, this person is asking, is this, isn't this suspect to anyone? 1,600 people agreed with that or liked it. It's like they're mocking us at this point. And that this is messed up. They got a movie that's like, and what it's like what's going on in the world today. All this is devil people. <laughs> Fight for your life. So is it uh, undertones of a religious conspiracy, war? And of course there's hypocrisy. I thought no more movies were supposed to be made or produced during the lockdown. And whoever okayed this, needs to be smacked in the mouth. So it also has brought out some violent tendencies, I think, or suggestions anyway. And the question everyone should be asking is, when did this film begin? And this is gonna be an important question in just a few minutes when we get to the next part of the presentation. But 4,000, over 4,000 people agreed with this sentiment that we need to be asking when the movie was made. 5,000, over 5,000 people thought that this movie is like releasing a 9-11 movie between the planes hitting the towers and collapsing, which is quite a serious position to take. And 5,000 people agreed. So let's see. Um, one person again brought up the music saying that they thought it was weird that the refrain from Bob Marley's song, this is my message to you, don't worry about a thing, was suspicious. And then we have again, straight predictive programming with this movie. It's so obvious at this point. So it was suggesting a conspiracy. Another person said, this isn't fear, it's predictive programming. And again, Bob Marley's artist disrespect. So what is predictive programming? Predictive programming is the theory that the government or other high ups are using fictional movies or books as a mass mind control tool to make the population more accepting of planned events. So this gets back to the comment in, um, in the trailer when someone asked, we need to understand when this movie was made potentially suggesting that this movie was made far in advance of the, po the pandemic to get society used to, potentially used to what would t uh, take place. So predictive programming was first described and proposed by researcher Alan Watts. And it's a subtle form of programming, psychological programming provided by the media. And what makes this different than typical media influence, propaganda, and psyops is that there's a suggestion of an intentional partnership between media and government and other authorities. So I'd like to know what you think about that. So I have a few questions. As well as desensitizing people to the death of black people, some black people refer to the death of dying black people as racist porn for white supremacists. And is that an over overly sensitive view of media that continues to replay the videos of uh, black people dying due to police brutality? Think about that and think about what do you think about thematic movies being created during a time when the theme is currently being expo experienced and emotions are running high? So that could be, as I said, when people are dying due to police brutality or when there's a, a global pandemic and people are dying and people are afraid. Should movies like that or videos that are captured of those events be released?
Do artists in various other forms of media makers, such as citizens on the scene of a crime or, or an event, have a responsibility to society when considering whether they're going to release their media in the public sphere? And should art be allowed to imitate life at any point or only when people feel comfortable with it? And lastly, what are your thoughts on the media and the roles and responsibility of consumers when it comes to consuming media? Do they have a right or do they have a responsibility? I'm sorry, a responsibility to hold these media makers accountable, to hold media outlets accountable. And then lastly, there are many areas in which we consider the role and responsibility of media makers and media consumers. It's not always about race or physical health, but it's about mental health, gender considerations, etc. So this is, a, as I was as I was uh, putting the final touches together for my presentation, this came through my mailbox. And it was about the outrage over a potential show that's currently in development, it's not even been released, causing consternation with the mental health community. And it was called Wildly Irresponsible and Callous. And it, that it endangers viewers. So we know that media is influential. But are we being too serious and overly sensitive when we can't create a movie about what really happens in our lives? So it brings me back to my earlier question. Should movies that make people sensitive or maybe sensitive to people who have personal experience with the subject matter get made or should they be shelved? Is there an intentional demonstration of insensitivity when they do get made? And that's the end of my presentation. So if there are any questions, um, I will be happy to hear them and, and have some discussion. Um, thank you so much, um, Ava. Um, um, we're waiting to see if there are any questions coming up. But, um, but I, I have some questions while, uh, while we are um, waiting. Um, 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 I was thinking about this um, predictive programming as a, as a concept, uh, which I hadn't, uh, I was not aware of that um, concept, but I was sort of, I don't know, while, while listening to, to, to your presentation, I was thinking about this, um, oh, what was it called? It, um, you know, this uh, um, idea that in commercials, for, uh, for instance, uh, I think it was liminal, no, um, you know, where, they, where uh, it was uh, this idea that some, someone could put in images that sort of made you think about uh, something, like uh, yes. this is, uh, no. uh, case with Coca-Cola, for instance, where somebody right. was uh, like uh, spelling out sex, <laughs> uh, but just in one frame, so it was so quick, but like these yes. kinds of ideas. So, mm -hmm. so um I wonder it's sort of this predictive programming, this idea about that, if you could sort of elaborate a little bit. Um, sure. So so I, I believe what you're speaking of is subliminal yeah, yeah, yeah. programming. Thank you. Thank you. It was just yes. a word that... Um, uh-huh. Right. And it happens all the time. And what subliminal programming does is it flies beneath our radar. So our subconscious picks it up, but we are not consciously understanding that we're picking up this image of Coca-Cola or eating a hamburger, but subconsciously we say to ourselves, oh, I really like a Coke or I really like a hamburger right now. And that, that is a, an integral part of advertising success. Predictive programming, on the other hand, is when government and media with forethought determine that they're going to create a media and release it based on the topic that they want people to become less sensitive to. So for instance, in this case, they were asking about the pandemic. If they knew, and this is a, this again borders on conspiracy theories, but if they, the, the government and media 
knew that a pandemic was coming or was going to actually be initiated through some kind of uh, intentional means, uh, not a natural occurrence, but a forced occurrence, if they knew that and they wanted to prepare people in advance so that they could get used to the idea that things were going to close down, they were going to have to wear masks, that eventually they may be asked to take a vaccine. And when people start to get used to an idea, they become less sensitive to it and they become more compliant. And so that's kind of the theory behind predictive programming. Let's take out the fight in people by getting them used to a topic and a potential outcome. And then when it actually happens, they'll be like, oh yeah, we knew this was gonna happen or we could see this coming. And you know, they were, they're less susceptible to um, being outraged or fighting against it. So, but this is, um, I just have to sort of <laughs> follow up uh, with, a, with, a, with a question that was sort of in, uh, in, in your answer uh, in a way, but, uh, um, but I was also then thinking about sort of the link between these um, sort of ideas and conspiracy theory, uh, which is um, uh, sort of one of the, uh, I think the world health organization i mean they have been warning about um uh, pandemics uh for a while um mm -hmm. this was sort of considered one of the most likely sort of catast catastrophes um happening um and also with conspiracy uh, theory which is also a major um global um, problem um so i wonder if you could sort of uh, give some reflections about sort of the links between this idea of predictive programming and and, uh, and conspiracy theory. Right. So, so one of the things that it's really important as uh, media consumers is that we look at things with a conscious and a critical lens. So pandemics have been around for hundreds of years. They're, they're not new. When people start to uh, verge on conspiracy theories, they probably are often not thinking about what has transpired before. It's often a new concept to them. And when media is dishonest and government is dishonest, there are reasons to think, well, maybe something is amiss here. Maybe they're not being honest with us. Um, and then that's why it's really important for media to be transparent when they're when they are bringing the news to people. Um, it doesn't serve anybody well to hide facts and information or to um, obscure information and create disinformation or misinformation. So there, there, is, a, there is some reason, I think, um, when people are suspicious of things, um, when they are not getting their full information. And that usually will start to happen um, start to be a conspiracy theory when people are feeling like they're not getting all of the information and that somebody is intentionally trying to harm them. And so I'll give you um, an example. In the, uh, largely in the black community, at least in the States, um, there's, there's hesitancy to get the vaccine. And the reason is there's been a long history of the medical I call it industry because with pharma and doctors and hospitals, all of those things work together to create an industry has um, had some um, disastrous intentions, ill intentions when it comes to the black community. They've used black bodies to experiment on. The reason we have the field of gynecology is because of the experimentation on black enslaved women. And so this, we have the Tuskegee experiment. We also have examples of forced sterilization. Black, the black community at large has a reason to be suspicious of government and medical institutions. And so when they look at the, a vaccine, they have this history, this legitimate, legitimate history to contend with and to try to, to provide balance with, this is a new day, a new era. We, um, this is, this is something that is happening to everybody, and it's not necessarily cons a conspiracy to get this vaccine, which can help people avoid getting corona. But again, 
you know, there is a reason to be able to think about things and really try to make the pieces work. And which is why it's, again, it's so transparent. It, it's so important that the media is transparent, that the government is transparent, that these pharmaceutical companies are transparent about the vaccine, what it does, what it doesn't do, those kinds of things. Yeah, I, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I just got a, a, a note saying, like, look in the camera uh, while you are uh, talking. But then again, which camera? This one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's three cameras. So, uh, <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, this camera? It's okay. Yes. <laughs> because it's like completely confusing uh, to, um, because now, now I can see myself in profile and I can look at you. Uh, but, uh, the camera is in uh, the roof. So uh, just <laughs> a bit confusing. Uh, which brings me back to the sort of final um, questions I, uh, question I, I have, uh, and that is um, to do with media, uh, sort of media literacy or uh, media, like critical literacy. So I don't know if you have some reflections on, on that, sort of relating to the presentation you had. Yes, well, definitely media literacy, and I, I um, call what I do conscious media literacy because it's really about creating awarenesses through a multicultural lens um, and being able to sort out uh, false narratives from accurate narratives and false misrepresentations uh, and misrepresentations from accurate representations. And not only do consumers need that ability, but content creators need that ability as well, so that when they're creating content, they're not intentionally or unintentionally um, creating false narratives and misrepresentations for consumers to consume. And consumers, when they have those skills of media literacy, whether it's critical or conscious, they are able to hold content creators accountable for the content that they create. And they're also to, they're also able to discern manipulative discourses and um, be able to weed through conspiracy theories and misinformation and disinformation. And it's a, it's an important skill to be able to do that uh, to be able to hold account uh, um, content creators accountable, as well as for our personal um, sake and esteem. We need to be able to discern false narratives and misrepresentations because a lot of times media is created to target people in certain ways. When we look at women in particular, um, young young women, young girls, the media is full of false narratives that you should look this way or you should act that way and this is what a woman does and it doesn't do. And so we need to be able to educate people so that they can discern um, that accurate information and not let, not internalize it to their detriment. So media literacy is a critical skill for both con content creators so that they, they don't perpetuate false narratives and misrepresentations and for media consumers so that they don't internalize them. Thank you. So um, I think uh, we'll uh, have to close uh, the session uh, now. Thank you so much, um, Ava, for uh, joining us. Uh, here and sorry uh, for all the technical backlash at the beginning, but uh, that's life um, in a real pandemic. <laughs> uh, so uh, right. nice to to see you and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy uh, your stay in Croatia. So 